Okay. So um, I've gotten some questions. You see, you may see some of them here. I tried to hide the uh, any identities and stuff like that uh, that are associated with these questions. Uh, but I, I want to make sure that I hit these. And I also want to make sure I go over uh, homework two contained a lot of people sent in a lot of questions about homework number two. So I, I want to go through those quickly and I'm going to open them up and I'm going to start off by going through uh, homework two quickly. And I'm just going to maybe open up each problem and uh, 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 show it to you and uh, just make a quick comment about them. And if that's a particular problem for you, say something in the chat box, but try not to if it isn't because it'll slow us down. Then I'm going to go on to the specific problems people ask me about. Okay. Uh, problems number one and two. This is a coin toss, right? So coin toss, you know, there's a certain number of possibilities, heads, heads, heads tails, and so on and so forth. Uh, what's the probability of uh, uh, that AC? I don't know if uh, you guys got the message. I think there was an announcement on Blackboard. That's A with a small C at the top, a complement. Okay. A is the event of tossing at least one head. Well, you, you can count how many times one head comes up. And A complement is where does that not occur, right? So you can look to see which one where that doesn't occur. So just that that was a little bit of a problem because that C should have been a little C at the top. A complement, in other words, not A, where that doesn't occur. Um, uh, finding the indicated probability on uh, Scoring a certain rate, 20% of people with home-based computers have access to online service. 15 people with home are randomly and independently sampled. What is the probability at least one of those samples has at least has access uh, to online services? Okay, so we have 20% of the people, right? And we have, uh, we're going to sample 15%. Okay, what's the probability at least one of those sampled has access to online services? Two ways I could approach this. One way is say, well, 20%, maybe this is a binomial problem. They have it or they don't have it. Hmm, that sounds like a possibility. So now if, if that's the case, let's see. I, you know, if I sampled 15 people, uh, they would be asking me what's the probability, what's the probability that at least one of those samples has access to the online service? Hmm, hmm. Well, I know that I can use a binome distribution in Excel, and I, uh, I can use uh, that binome distribution with either a cumulative function or a, uh, 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 a cumulative function true or cumulative sum function false. So what's the probability at least one of those sampled? Okay, at least one of them means what's the probability of one or two or three or four or five. And I'd hate to calculate all those probabilities, which is what they're looking for, right? So maybe I'll calculate the probability for what's below that. In other words, anybody want to hazard a guess on what you would find the probability for instead of, you know, since, we're, since if we say cumulative goes everything from that number down? Okay, let's take a look at it. Okay, uh, in this one, I'm going to change this one. I'm going to say 20% of people, that was a probability at least three of the sampled homes have access to online services. So I changed the problem a bit. Okay, I'm gonna open up Excel. Okay, and I think, nope, that's not it. Da, da, da. Let's see, I'm gonna open up a new, new workbook. I'm gonna blow this up so we can actually see it a little bit better. Okay, I'm gonna type in here equals binome dist parentheses. Okay, next thing it's going to ask me is for number of successes, trials, probability of success, and cumulative. Okay, well, we're looking at a problem here where success is the person has online services. And the number of trials is, well, we sampled 15 people. So, number of successes, I said, I said three or more, right? Well, if I put a three in here, and eventually I'm going to have to choose cumulative, it's going to give me the probability for three, two, one, and zero right? Uh, people that have uh, uh, online services, right? So if I want three or more, I don't want to put three in there. I want to put two in there. So I'll get the probability for two, one, or zero. And that'll leave, uh, 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 that probability is going to be uh, what's left after three, four, five, six, and all the rest of them. So I'm going to say two comma 15 uh, sample size, so trials of 15. The probability was, was a 0.25 or 0.2. 
I'll use the same, I'll, I'll use 0.25 for my problem. It's 0.2 there actually, and I'll say true. And close parentheses, this is the probability that two, one, or zero, since I said true, it's cumulative, two, one, or zero, all added up together, uh, have online services. So the probability is 23% that two or fewer people have online services. So that means that the probability is 74% or 77% that, that three or more people have online uh, services, right? So yeah, and Ashley's got the right idea for that one. I don't want to give that problem away too much. So yeah, so exactly. That's how, how you would do that. How, that's how you would use this particular function. So remember, if I had said now, if I had said false there, right, that would have given me the probability only for exactly two out of 15 people having uh, online services out of this population. Okay, so it's not, it's not really all that complicated. You just have to, no, again, that's exactly what I was talking about. You have to read this problem and you have to recognize it as a binomial problem. Okay, now, now usually uh, you'll get a percentage or a probability or a prevalence for a disease or something like this. So 20% of people have online, have access. So it's, it's two possibilities, have it or don't have it. So that's kind of a giveaway. That's a binomial distribution. Later on, there's going to be a couple of problems where we're going to use where we're going to use a, uh, an approximation to the normal for the binomial distribution. But I'll, let's hold off on that for now. Survey of 4,491 4, respondents. Uh, uh, how often they attended religious services? The responses are as follows. What's the probability that a randomly selected respondent attended religious services more than once a year? OK, well, first of all, number one, I didn't see given that they were Catholic, given that they were uh, white, given that they were Caucasian, given that they were uh, over 55. I didn't see any given. I didn't see anything that suggested this is a cumulative, uh, 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 excuse me, a uh, conditional probability. All I saw was, you know, uh, uh, mentions of, uh, uh, of how, what's the probability that they would attend one or more. Okay. So, how many did they actually attend? They actually attend 4,400. The survey was 4,491. I presume if you add these all up, that'll add up to 4,491. So the probability that they would attend, that they would never attend, right, is going to be 1,020 over 4,491. So I'll leave it up to you to figure out what's the probability that they would attend more than what is it more, more than once per year. So that more than once per year would be, uh, uh, let's see, it's once per year, several times a year. I guess that would count. You know, this would count. This would count. This. So figure out which of these numbers count, and you can figure out your pro your probabilities. Uh, question was, how do you know when to look at the cumulative versus non-cumulative? Let me just go back to binomial distribution again. Okay, if the problem asked, uh, what's the probability? that you got exactly three people out of uh, 15 that uh, had online services, exactly three. Two doesn't count, one doesn't count, zero, four doesn't count, so exactly three. Probability of getting exactly three is 22%. That's pretty, that's pretty likely. It's pretty likely because 25% uh, of the people have it, and we're talking about a sample of 15 people, so it, it, that's pretty close to what we would expect, right? So, so um, uh, that's the probability exactly three. If I change this to true, it'll give me the probability that three, two, one, or zero people have all of that probability together. So that's pretty likely. That's 46%, right? And the probability, now if I clicked into there, if that's the probability that uh, 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 three or fewer people have uh, online services. Well, then if I subtract that from one, oops, one minus that number, that's the probability that not three or more, four or more have, right? Because three or less is here, that would be four or more. So you gotta be a little bit careful with that. Okay, so good question four. Which of the following sampling distributions of, now, you know, I, I suspect because some of the questions, some of the people's questions uh, confused me uh, in terms of like they would say it was number six or something like that. And then I look at number six and the question didn't seem relevant to number six. 
Uh, I'm getting the feeling that the, possibly that the way the assignment was set up, that it randomizes the uh, sequence of numbers. You can tell me as I go, as you go through to this, you can tell me if your question number four is different than my question number four. You know, so I, I got uh, the sequence is definitely different. Yeah, that's what I figured. That makes it a little harder for me to figure out, you know, from your questions, which ones to look at. That's why I'm kind of going through this first. Which of the following sampling distributions of X bar has the least amount of variability? Okay, let's take a look at this. First of all, number one, did they mention population variability or did they mention sample variability? Okay, always look for something in the problem that tells you whether they're talking about a sample or a population. Well, in this problem, what's the following sampling distributions of X bar has the least amount of variability? Well, let's see. Um, the first one, mu is equal to 50. Uh, well, this mu and sigma, what do they refer? They refer to the population. But the, the question is asking about the sampling variability. In other words, for samples of size 100, samples of size 30, samples of size 30. So let's see. Mu is equal to 50. Sigma is equal to 10 for the population. So population number two has the least amount of variability because it's got the smallest standard deviation. But you know, the sample distribution may not have the, the smallest uh, 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 variability because when I calculate the standard deviation for the repeated samples of that size, in other words, for the standard error, right, I'm going to get a different number because it's going to be sigma over the square root of the sample size. I'm going to leave that to you to calculate, right, because, because of these, uh, this is the population information. That's the sample size. Now it's up to you to figure out what the standard deviation would be for each one of these populations given that sample size and see which one is the smallest number or least variable number. Okay, but you do have enough information to give it to, to figure it out there, right? Everybody agree with that? Did I lose you guys already? Okay, good. All right, good. Uh, let's see. Let's go to five and six. All right. Uh, table below, uh, ba -ba, blood type and gender showed the probability a person is male, given that their blood type is A. I'm going to change that a bit. Uh, find the probability that a person is female, given that their blood type is B. What kind of probability is this? You saw that you had the word given. Now, it's going to be a conditional probability. So you're not just going to look at the total. Like, for instance, if, you, if I had asked you, what's the probability that a person... Uh, uh, is is uh, uh, has a blood type of A, you would say, well, we have this many people, the sum of 0.226 and 0.177, that's the number of people that have a blood type of A out of the total number of people. And these are proportions, so it would be over, uh, out of, over one, I guess, if you added up all the people, right? So, so um, uh, that's, you know, if it's not a conditional probability, it's pretty straightforward. For instance, what's the probability that someone have blood type of O and be female, right? Blood type of O and be female together is 26% of the people in this survey have that. So that's all you would need. But this is a conditional probability. So I'm asking, what's the probability a person is, is female given their blood type is B? Well, what proportion of the population is B? Well, 0.62%, 6.2%, and 3.6%. So all together... 9.8% of the population has, uh, uh, has a uh, uh, blood type of B, but 6.2% of the population is female out of that group of A, right? So considering only, since I, since I said, given that the blood type is B, since only 9% of the population uh, has a blood type of B, the probability of them being female is 6.2% out of that 9%. Right, so you're gonna you're gonna uh, be doing the same thing. It's actually number fourteen on the blackboard assignment two. Oh, for you, yeah. See what happens is it randomizes the numbers. Uh, this is I see this when I run it. See, I see this as problem number five. You know, because because every one of you uh, see it as a different problem number. Um, for uh, for whatever reason, I guess um, uh, in this particular case, it randomized the uh, the the pre presentation of the problem. It's also possible. It's also possible. I'm not sure, um, but it's also possible that, like, you may not all be seeing exactly the same problem set. There may be you might be seeing 21 problems out of a group of 30 
so that there may be some problems that some people are seeing other people's aren't aren't i don't think so though i think you all see the same problems just uh just in a different sequence the following table shows the political affiliation of voters in one city and their positions on stronger gun controls law okay what's the probability that a democrat opposes stronger gun control again a conditional probability because first we're talking that we're only looking at Democrats. So another way of phrasing that, what is what is the probability that a person opposes gun control laws given that he's a Democrat would be basically the same thing as saying this. I'm going to change it a little bit. What's the probability that a Republican favors gun control? Okay, well, first of all, you got to be a Republican to start off with. So uh, you got, uh, let's see, uh, Republicans represent 0.11 and 0.27 right? That would be 0.38, right? 38% of this population. Of that, 11% uh, 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 favor gun control. So 11% over 11 plus 27, uh, 0.11 plus 0.27, or uh, whatever that fraction comes out to, right? You'd only be looking at the ones that, you'd only be narrowing this down to the condition that's given that they be Democrats or Republicans. So I'll leave that up to you to answer that question. Okay, let's take a look at seven. Um, 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 assume the heights of adult Caucasian men have a mean of 67.9%. I, I, uh, I think this might have come up. Uh, and a standard deviation of 2.8%. Okay, so far, 67%, 67.9% and standard deviation 2.8%. Am I talking about the population or the sample so far? Up to this point right now in this problem. Somebody give me a, a, a buzz back. Talking about the population, right? Now, if 64 men are randomly selected, aha, now we're talking about the uh, 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 sample. Find the probability that they have a mean height greater than 68.9 inches. Okay, so now we're talking about a sample size of 64, and we want to know what the probability is that they have a mean height greater than 68, uh, 68.9 inches. I'm gonna, again, I'm going to change these numbers a little bit as I work on them. And let me see if I can't find my, uh, let's see, I'm going to pull this up. Okay, so I'm going to change the problem a bit. Um, I have a population of men whose average height, oops, average height equals uh, 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 70 inches with a uh, standard deviation of uh, two inches. And so I'm going to, I'm not going to bother to draw the population. I take a sample of size 100 from that population. So what is my distribution of samples of size 100 look like? Well, it's going to have approximately the same mean as the population, but the standard deviation, in other words, the standard error is going to be different because it's a sample. It's going to be equal to sigma. This should be sigma over the square root of n. Remember, because that's a population standard deviation. It's going to be equal to 2 divided by 10 or 0.2. So now, uh, if we were to ask, was that a lower number or a higher number? I forget. Uh, they asked for 68. The mean was 60, so it's a higher number. What's the probability, probability to have a mean height greater than that? Okay. So let's say I ask you, what's the probability that uh, uh, someone, uh, that a sample comes up, does it, did it say sample? Uh, probabil uh, yeah, probability that the sample that you draw, 64 people, has a mean height greater than, say, 71 inches. Okay, we're looking for this area here, right? Greater than 71. What's the probability, the percentage of the distribution that's above this number? Okay, so we know that uh, the Z score here, Z, is equal to 71 minus, this is a zero, 71 minus zero over the standard deviation or standard error in this case, which is 0.2. So that's going to be equal to a Z score of uh, a five. Okay, so now that Z score of five is, is like a ridiculously large Z score. You won't even find it on your table. But one thing you should keep in mind though, whatever Z, let's say it came out to a Z score, let's, let's make that 70.2, right? 70.2. 70.2 minus 7 is equal to z score of 1, right? That would be a z score of 1, right? On your table, when you go to your table, it would give you an area to the left of this, 
but they're asking for the probability. If you use the Agresti's uh, table, they're asking you for the probability that's greater than uh, a z score of one. So you would have to subtract that from this area from one in order to get the answer. Okay, you guys okay with the z table? You don't need me to pull the z table. Anybody need me to pull the z table up and uh, take a look at it from there and, and actually show you how you would look that up? Nope. Everybody okay with the z table? Should I? Should I I'll, I'm going to do it anyway because I don't want to embarrass you into. If you don't need, if you don't want to say that you need it. Okay, so Z table. Uh, negative Z scores are on the left of the mean. Positive Z scores are on the right of the mean. In this case, we're going to be to the right of the mean. It's going to look like this because we're to the right of the mean. It's going to be a positive number. So for a Z score of 1, we'd go down here to 1.0. We'd go over to, to 1.00, which is 0 0.86 or 86.4%. So this area would be 86.4%. So if I go back to my problem, if I can find it again back here in this mess, if I go back to my problem, uh, this would be, uh, I'm going to round it off, 86%, which would leave 14% for the probability that, uh, uh, that that sample of 64 people would have a mean above 70.2 in this case. So we're doing the same thing. Thank you, Peter. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go on to the next one here. Which one was this? Uh, da -da, da -da -da. Okay, find the probability of the given event. A fair dice is rolled. The number on the dice is uh, a fair die, one dice. The number on the dice is a three or a five. You have two possibilities. Could be a three, could be a five. Both of them satisfy that probability. Uh, if I were to ask you, what's the probability that it was a two, right? Well, there's six faces on a dice. For those of you that don't play craps or, or roll dice, right? the six faces on one through six is numbers on the dice. It's going to come up. One of those numbers is equally likely for all of them. So the probability of being a one is one out of six. Probability of being a two is one out of six. Probability of being three, one, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if you give me two possibilities or three possibilities or four possibilities, right? Well, the possibility, the possibility is of it's being a one, a two, a three, a four, or five, or a six any one of those four is one, is 100%, right? So I'll leave that to you to figure out. I don't think that you'll have much difficulty with that. Okay, let me go back to, uh, oops, I got the wrong one. Here we go. Okay, find an appropriate response. The body temperatures of uh, adults have a mean of 98.6 degrees and a standard deviation of 0.6 degrees. Talking about the population or a sample, right? That to me looks like population, right? They didn't say anything about a sample. Describe the center and variability of the sampling. Ah, now we are. The very sampling distribution of the sample mean for a random sample of 50 adults. Well, we know again that, that they gave us the mean for the population. So we would expect the mean for our sample to be the same. And... Uh, they gave us the standard deviation for the population, but uh, we now need the, the standard deviation for the sample of size 50. So we know sigma is equal to, uh, uh, excuse me, standard deviation or standard error is equal to uh, standard deviation of the population sigma over the square root of the sample size. So we know how to proceed on that one. Uh, for a particular test, the sensitivity and specificity were reported as 0.96 and 0.96. 93. Suppose the prevalence was actually 0.03. Calculate the probability that an individual actually is a drug user given the test result is positive. Okay, so in other words, calculate probability that an, a, a, a drug user, that, that pro probability that an individual is a drug user given that the test result is positive. In other words, that the person really has the condition given he tested positive. What's that called? What's the name for the probability that a person actually has the disease or condition given that he tested positive? Great, positive predictive value. There's a couple of ways that you could solve this. One way is to use Bayes' uh, formula. Okay, and let me see if I got it here. Bayes' formula. Okay, here's Bayes' formula. I'll blow it up a little bit so we can see a little bit better. Okay, this is actually a... a, a uh, uh, a specific use of Bayes' formula or a derivation of Bayes' formula. 
you guys seen this before? Has this come up in a lecture? I, I think it might have appeared in a lecture or in the textbook or somewhere. Right? Yes or no? Is this the first time you're looking at this? That formula? Uh-oh. Some of you have seen it. Some of you have seen it. Okay. You can use this formula. And if you want to use this formula, you got to know the sensitivity, the prevalence, and the specificity. That's it. It's Otherwise, it's just a math problem. Here's what you need for the positive predictive value. Here's what you need for the negative predictive value. Uh, you can Google this formula if you want uh, a base formula for positive for a predictive value, a positive predictive value. You, you'll find in images of this and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm not going to leave this up here too long. I, I'm going to put this up afterwards so you can scrub to it or go to it if you need it. But you can actually apply this formula. I'm going to show you another way that might be interesting because it's informative in terms of understanding um, uh, uh, cross tabs and how they work. Okay, let's take a look at this. Okay, I'm going to make up a population here. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay. Nine, a sensitivity is 96 and 93 and 0.03. Okay. Okay, 96, 93, and 0.03. Again, I'm going to change some stuff. I'm going to make this 90. I'm going to make this 80. This is our sensitivity. This is our specificity, and this is our prevalence right here. So I'm going to make up a cross-tab box. Okay. And this is going to be uh, 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 test positive, test negative. This is going to be disease positive and disease negative. Okay, so this person is going to be a true positive. They have the disease, they test it positive. Okay, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to extend these boxes out here and out at the bottom so I get my totals and stuff like that. I am going to make up a fake population. I'm going to make up a fake population of a thousand. I'm going to I choose this number to make it big enough that I wind up with basically whole numbers in here. Right? I could make it ten thousand or hundred thousand. It really doesn't matter. Okay. Oh well, yeah. Actually, there's a calculator that uses that formula on Blackboard that you can actually fill it in. But I'm going to show you this also. I'm going to start off with a population of 1,000. If I have a population of 1,000, the sum of this column, this number in here, is the number of people that have the disease, whether they tested positive or negative. This is all of the people that have the disease. Out of 1,000 people, right, if the prevalence is 3%, how many people have the disease? Right, 3. Oh, no, 30. Good guess, though. Right, you had the right idea, but not quite. Not, not, we missed the decimal place there. That's going to be 30, right? So that's going to be 970. So 3% 3, 3 of 100 would be 3. 3% 3 of 1,000 uh, is 30. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I trust me, I do it plenty myself. So if the sensitivity is 90%, that means that 90% of the time we will correctly diagnose these people. So if we're going to diagnose 30 people, and 90% of the right, their time we're right, 90% of 30 is going to be 27. And that means that 10% of the time we're going to be wrong. So now, next, I'm going to look at the people that are negative. This is the total number of people that, were, that are negative. We know that 80% of the time we correctly identify people as being negative. So I'm going to go get my calculator out since uh, it's more than a single digit kind of thing. Okay, and I'm going to say, okay, 970 people. Um, um, times, we're right 80% of the time, 0.8. So out of that, we're going to be right for 776 people. Now, where do I put the 776 people? On the top or in the bottom? Can I get a guess there from somebody? Bottom, 776. Because these are the correct results. If you don't have the disease, you want to test negative, right? So we're going to be right 776 percent, uh, 776 people out of 970. So the number of times we're going to be wrong, it's going to be 970 minus uh, so, or 10 percent of of this, which is uh, uh, excuse me, uh, 20 percent of this, which is 97. Let's see, okay, 970 
this is gonna I'm gonna subtract I'm gonna subtract this from this. This is gonna be four. Carry to one. I'm not used to subtracting upside down. Uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah, I am having a problem here. To subtract 294. Okay, good. Thank you very much. As I said, uh, okay, does that come out right? It was 194. Right, 194. Okay, 194. If you add them together, you get 970. Okay, so what's the total number of people that have tested positive? The total number of people that have tested positive is 27 plus 194. One, uh, uh, 11, uh, one, uh, zero, oh, excuse me, 10, and two is two, carried one. 221 people have tested positive, right? So what's our positive predictive value? Well, it's, it's, it's the number of people that tested positive that actually have the disease. So that's 27 over 221, right? That's going to be, I'm going to guess something like 12%. Our positive predictive value is approximately 12%. Okay, so you could solve this problem without remembering that, uh, that uh, uh, formula, right? And maybe in the, uh, uh, on the way, you learn a little bit about the uh, 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 cross tabs and diagnostic tests. Uh, just for the hell of it, what's the negative predictive value? Right? Anybody want to hazard a guess at what the negative predictive value is? Well, this adds up to seven, seven, nine. Right? So, how many times do we get it right first time? How many times do we get it wrong? How many people were properly identified? Right, seven seventy six over seven seventy nine. It's much higher. Right. The the reason why the positive predictive value is so low is because our prevalence is very low. There's not many people in the population that have this disease. So even though we got a pretty good sensitivity, 90%, we're still going to get a lot of false positives because uh, uh, that remaining 10% is applied to a big part of the population that doesn't have the disease. Okay, let's move away from that. Identify the type of study. A uh, group of men who were tracked uh, for 10 years who had scored 130, uh, likely to suffer a severe depression. Those who uh, had, uh, bah, 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 uh, um, uh, they only, I, they, get, they must give you more than two choices there, right? They might, do I have both choices? Uh, blow 130 on intelligence. Okay, a group of uh, a group of men were tracked for 10 years. Anyone want to guess what kind of study that is? I'm not going to give you the answer on that one. You, let, you could have retrospective, prospective, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have a little bit of a disagreement there, right? Let me give you, rather than answer that question for you, let me give you a perspective, okay? Let's say I want to, uh, 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 there's, um, uh, th there's something called a framing hand study where they followed, they, they, they um, uh, 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 I think they, they actually did a survey of, I don't know, 50,000 doctors, I believe. Uh, I think it was in New England. I don't know if it was across country. I think it might've been only in New England. And, and they asked those doctors to take part in this study. And they started in, I don't know, I guess in the early, late 60s, early 70s or something like that. And they asked them about their smoking habits and their health, right? And they started and they followed up with those doctors every year to find out if they uh, had cardiovascular disease, if they had cancer and so on and so forth, what kind of cancer and what their smoking habits were and so on and so forth. So that's a, when they set that study up, they assigned, they, they found those doctors and they were going to follow them going forward, right? So that's different than if they had gone to 50,000 doctors in Massachusetts and said, oh, um, um, uh, let's look at these records for these doctors and look back in history on, you know, their health records and see uh, what, you know, see if they were smokers and if they were uh, uh, if they had lung cancer today, uh, we'll look at the ones that have lung cancer, the ones that don't have lung cancer today and look back in their history. One of those obviously is prospective. The other one is retrospective. So I won't give you the answer on that one, but you should be able to figure it out from what I just told you, I think. Right. Okay. So let's go on to the next one. Let's see. Number 12, 13. Let's see. Uh, use a table of areas to find the specified area under the normal curve. 
the shaded area is shown. I'm going to blow that up a little bit. Oh, I'm glad I blew it up. I thought that was 1.98. Okay, it's minus 0 0.188 to plus 0.188. Well, first of all, number one, I know that minus 0.196, which is a little wider than this, to minus to plus 1.96 is what percentage of the distribution? Right? Anybody want to hazard a guess on that? 1.96 in either direction is 95%. So this area in here is less than 95%. So I can eliminate that one. And I know it's not 45 and 6%. So I'm left with only two possibilities. Okay, so now it's up to you to go to the Z table and figure out what that is. One of the ways that you can do it is that I might approach this. I'm not going to do it for you, but the way I might approach it is I would go to this negative side over here. Look up the area to the left here on the Z table, right? Let's say that area is 5%. What's the area on the top here? Anybody want to ask guess? Oh, okay. The answer that comes up after calculation the answer is not on the choice. I think it's never mentioned that in email. Um, 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 on the, uh, let me go back to that. Let me finish up with this first. Um, yeah, on the top is 5%, on the bottom is 5%. So all you need to know is the difference. So really, all you have to do is one look up in a z-table to solve this problem just that one uh in there uh, i guess yeah some of you have already gotten some feedback that there is an error in the choices okay and that you'll all get credit for it on the homework okay let's take a look at question number uh, uh 13 you guys got, got you know what got what i was looking there uh, what i wanted to 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 uh, uh emphasize there is that if you think a little bit ahead you can save yourself some trouble and just only need to look up one area there rather than look up this area from here to here and this area from there to there and subtract that from that and so on and so forth. It's really only one area you need to look up there. Now, if this were a different number than 1.88, then these two areas here wouldn't be symmetrical. So you'd have to use another uh, logical approach to it, right? For instance, if this were 1.92 or something like that, then you'd have to find the area from 1.92 to the left and then subtract from that the area from 1.88 to the left, because then these two areas wouldn't be uh, uh, symmetrical because they wouldn't be the same amount because they wouldn't have the same Z number. Okay, enough on that, I think. Right? Um, uh, let me reduce this a little bit so I can get the whole thing in again. Uh, uh, da -da in one region, the September energy consumptions for single family homes had a mean of 1,000 kilowatt hours and a standard deviation of 218 kilowatt hours. Okay, population sounds like that describe the center and variability of the sampling distribution for uh, 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 of the sample mean for a random sample of 80 single family homes. Okay, that's this problem is really similar to some of the other ones we just did, right? They gave you a population mean, they gave you a population standard deviation, and they ask you for a, uh, uh, a sample distribution for uh, 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 a, a sample size of 80. Uh, I, da, da, da. Uh, I'm not I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question on uh, in, so in this case could we add um, uh, um, if we're talking about this particular problem, right? Uh, I would see uh, if we're using the Z table in um, uh, uh, Gresty, uh, it's always measuring the area to the left of value you're looking up. So I, you could, uh, this area would be, uh, uh, this would be uh, one area, cover the whole thing, and then we would need to remove this part from the percentage. So we would determine what this is and subtract this from that number. Okay, I think, I think um, uh, rather than uh, the only reason you would add is if, if you knew this was a certain percentage, if you just if, if these two Z numbers were the same and you uh, uh, then said, well, that's one percent. So since it's symmetrical, it's the same Z number at the top. Uh, this must be one percent, too. You would add them together and subtract them from 100 to get the area between them. Uh, variability means. You know, uh, that's a good question. 
the most common hmm, that's well I'll actually tell you the truth you'll know in a second won't you in other words if you actually do this problem if you actually calculate what the standard deviation or standard error for the samples is you know by taking standard deviation of a square root of sample size you'll know which of those that you're dealing with but yeah kind of they're kind of using the term in a lot of these problems we've been using the term variability uh to to mean standard deviation and we know that if the, technically the term variance is the square of the standard deviation but i think for the most part when somebody asks you what's the variability of this population uh they're going to answer they're not going to be expecting you to give you give them the variance they're probably going to be expecting you to give them the standard deviation because it's a much more useful tool for determining probabilities and so on and so forth right so i'm going to guess let me just see something here I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this problem in my head here uh, 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 that's um, I don't think you can, I, I don't think it would ever be the variant. It wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be standard error squared because uh, that doesn't, that's, that is not in any of the possibilities. No, no chance of mixing it up there. 